بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I do apologize for the voice but your weather has its impact on us people coming from the desert so inshallah bear with me and I'll try to make it as soft as possible Islam places a great role on time because time is the essence of our lives. It is something that, unlike most of us think, the countdown starts the minute we are born. It's not like how old you are, I'm 20 and 10 years later I'm 30 and it goes up, it's the other way around. How many days left in your life? And Islam places a great deal on time as we can see this clearly in the Quran and in the Sunnah. Our lives, unlike other religions, unlike other people, our lives are based on time. From the very beginning, the first thing you do when you wake up in the day is to pray Fajr. And you don't begin your day and that is it. Every time you're conscious of time. So when is Dhuhr? The second prayer. When is Asr? The third. Maghrib? The fourth. And finally Isha. This is the last prayer of the day. And you are quite aware of this. It is something in your conscience that tells you time is important. I have to know when time it is for prayer. And you conclude your day or night, if uh, to say, by water, night prayer. So throughout the whole day, there are times that are essential. And that is why Allah mentioned it in the Quran by saying, Inna salata kanat ala al-mu'minina kitaban maqoota. Which means that prayer has been obligated upon believers on specific times. What does that mean? A lot of the Muslims don't know this. But what was the last prayer that we prayed? Asr. Some of us did not pray Asr. Is that true? Possible. Why? They'll pray it when they go back to their campus, to their, to their homes. They pray it after Maghrib, after the lecture, after the match probably. A lot of the Muslims did not pray Dhuhr and Asr, maybe since Fajr. They're anticipating the match. The Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, whoever sleeps over a prayer or forgets it, must pray it as soon as he remembers it. There is no expiation, there is no kafara for that except doing this. Which means that I did not forget and I did not sleep, but I deliberately postponed the prayer until the time was over, until the following prayer was due. So can I pray it afterwards? The answer is, no you can't. Can't I pray qada? Wouldn't it be acceptable to make it up? No, it, you can't. Even if you do, it's not going to be accepted from you. What is this? It's the first time I hear such a thing. Well. Is always the first. The hadith is crystal clear. Whoever sleeps or forgets must pray it as soon as he remembers. There is no expiation. I didn't do a sin to expiate it. But the Prophet is telling us that the importance of the prayer only if you sleep or forget that you can make it up. Otherwise, you cannot make it up. When do people stand in Mount Arafah in Hajj? What date? <coughs> Hello. What day do we go to Arafah in Hajj? Ninth of Hijjah. So if someone books his flight, he gets delayed for a couple of days, then he makes it, then he is held in customs for a couple of days. On the 13th, 5th, 13th of the Hijjah, he goes to Arafah on his own and he spends a day there, mashallah, making dhikr, reading the Quran. Is it his Hajj accepted? Why? Because it was not on time. 
Therefore, time is very essential. And a lot of the Muslims skip prayers like crazy. Don't make up for these prayers. Allah will not accept it from you. I know a lot of the Muslims, where I come from, from Saudi, when they pray on time. But when they travel to London, for example, they make jam'a and qasr, which is sunnah. It's permissible. They pray dhuhr and asr at the same time, two rak'as, two rak'as, maghrib and isha at the same time, Two rakas, two rakas. Maghrib is shortened to how much? Two, two. It, it does not change. Three and two. And after three, four days, being in London, no mosques, nobody's watching, they tend to put to delay the whole five raka, five prayers just before they go to bed. So you just see them doing this. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, it's done. Seventeen rakas, it's done. Alhamdulillah. And after two or three more days, there's no prayer at all until they go back home, make Umrah, Tawaf, Sa'i, oh Allah forgive us, and they go back to the routine they had been. These people's prayer is not accepted because they deliberately postpone it until the end of the day, and this is haram. Not only throughout the day and night that time is essential and important, we also have that through the week. There's a precious and sacred day every week that we honor, that is the day of, of Jum'ah. It is the weekly festival, the weekly Eid, if you wish, where Allah Azza wa Jal has granted us so many things on this great day that lots of the Muslims don't even know anything about. It is only just to bring to your attention that on the day of, 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 of Jum'ah, of Friday, there's a, a period of time, an hour. In Arabic, hour is not 60 minutes, it's a period of time. There is a moment in Jum'ah, the Prophet tells us that as some, whoever coincides with that moment in prayer, in supplicating, in invoking, invoking Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah would answer his invocation. God, I have a very big problem with Calculus 301. <laughs> it is bad. What should I do? I uh, Maybe I yes, should write short notes and put them in my pocket. Nobody knows. No people here are so trustworthy. I write it on my forearm and I have to do this. Uh, maybe put an MP3 uh, um, headset I can communicate with others. No. And on Friday, after you studied well and you did all what you can, at the last hour of the day, like half an hour before Maghrib, just sit in the masjid, raise your hands, praise Allah, salli on the Prophet offer him salutation, and then ask Allah, invoke Allah Azza wa Jal. Wallahi, you will pass with the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal. But don't do this without studying. Don't say, okay, I like this hour, why should I study? I just go there, and invoke Allah Azza wa Jal. No, this is not, this is insane. He said, Shaykh, I have tawakkul, I have reliance on Allah Azza wa Jal. You have true tawakkul on Allah? He said, yes, I believe in Allah. He said, go to a high riser and jump. <laughs> no, this is insane, Shaykh. No, no, you have strong tawakkul. You have to have tawakkul with taking and, and, and achieving the necessary means. But to sit home, without any food and without going to cook and say, Oh Allah, make me full. You have to eat. So no, no, I'll, I trust Allah. Allah, if He wishes, He'll make me full. You will be on a very severe diet. <laughs> uh, throughout the year, we have seasons. We have Ramadan. After Ramadan, we have Hajj. After Hajj, we have Ashura. We have the fasting of Arafah. We have fasting uh, three days. Uh, every month, the white days, we have Mondays and Thursdays. So, time is quite of essence and importance in our Islam. And that is why Allah Azza wa Jal swore by time. So, Allah swore by Al Asr. What does Asr mean? Time. It's also the name of the period that is the afternoon. Allah swore of Al Fajr. Allah swore of Al Layl, Al Nahar, night and day. Fajr is uh, uh, dawn. Al Duha, which is the morning time that comes after Fajr time. 
And all of this is to underline the importance of time. So Allah swears with whatever He wishes only to show us the importance of these things, <coughs> the importance of His creatures. Now, can we swear with anything other than Allah? No, we can only swear by Allah and His beautiful attributes. Allah's mercy, Allah's uh, uh, power, Allah's honor, we can do this. Allah's words, we can do this. But we can't swear with um, prophets and messengers. We can't swear with, by the Prophet by saying, by the Prophet, this is right. Our friends from Egypt say this a lot. They say, what, how do you, they swear? Nabi. With Nabi. And our friends in a Sham area and Jordan, Syria, they swear with your head or with the head of your father. <laughs> say, Ras Abi. You swear with the things that you think highly of. In Islam, you can only swear by, the, by Allah Azza wa Jal. Because anything else would be associating others with Allah the Almighty. Now the Prophet tells us والسلام, in the authentic hadith that was reported by Imam al-Bukhari in the Sahih. He says, نِعْمَتَانِ مَغْبُونٌ فِيهِمَا كَثِيرٌ مِنَ النَّاسِ الصِّحَّةُ وَالْفَرَاغُ What does that translate to? Two blessings of Allah Azza wa Jal, which many people do not make the most of and thus lose out good health and free time. Good health and free time. These are blessings from Allah Azza wa Jal. The word used in the hadith, maghbun, al ghabn What is the meaning of al ghabn in Arabic? They did not translate it quite well. al ghabn is when you sell something below its original price. So my watch costs, for example, 2,000 pounds. If I sell it for 100 pounds, I would be maghbun. I, I, would, I would have had a, a bad bargain. And if you buy something way up or way more than its actual price, then you also have a bad bargain. The Prophet is telling us, alayhi salatu wasalam, people with time and health are in the same fashion. How much or how long did the matches of today took take? Excuse my English. How long? Six hours? Eight hours? And still going, maybe? Yeah, okay. At the time of, yeah, at, at the side of Allah, are you accountable for this time that was lost? Will Allah reward you good deeds? No. If you are renting a shop for a whole year and you're paying X amount of money, if you spend two months doing nothing, no decoration, no selling and no buying, the, the, the place is empty. Wouldn't this, these two months be considered as loss? Anyone who's doing economics maybe would help. Probably, it is definitely. So this time is lost time. It's from my life and the, and the, the clock is ticking. And the countdown had begun long, long ago when I was created. When I was four months old in my mother's womb, Allah sends an, an angel and, and the angel says, before uh, uh, breathing the spirit into that uh, embryo, he asks, oh Allah, what is the lifespan? Is he happy or unhappy? Meaning would be shaqi or sa'id, would be doomed to hell or to uh, uh, heavens? And how, low, how old is he? What about the things that he's going to do? What are his provisions? So the minute he does this, it is the countdown that starts. Now, the Prophet ﷺ is highlighting the importance of time. And he says, make the most of five things before five others. So what should we make uh, uh, the most of? The Prophet says, one, life before death. So make the best of your life. Before what? Before dying. Health before sickness. Health, you're healthy now. You're in the prime of your youth. 
utilize this because few years down the line when you're as old as I am, you're unable to do so many things you were able to do before. The Prophet says alayhi salatu wasalam, free time before becoming busy. So if you don't have exams, you think you, you have exams coming soon. But during the past three months, you had all the leisure time you needed and wanted. Did you utilize this? Now, can you utilize what you want to do in your time when you have exams? No. I'm preoccupied. I can't attend lectures. I can't go and do this and I cannot do that. I cannot visit my uncles because I have to do my, uh, uh, prepare for my exams, etc. So the Prophet is telling us, alayhi salatu wasalam, free time before becoming busy, youth before old age. And those who are in their 60s or in their 70s, unable to pray night prayer as they used to when they were 20 or 30 years old. So if somebody, someone is 70 years old and he tries to pray for a couple of hours, it is difficult. Bones are aching, back aches, knees are not able to carry him, and he's always sleepy. Even during daytime he's sleepy. This is age. It's not something that he can do anything about. This is life. And eventually he's going to die soon. Power off. End of story. End of game. Allah alam. Is it game over or does he have, inshallah, a better chance on the second life? And the Prophet says, alayhi salam, wealth before poverty. Now you have money, utilize it. Because there will come a time, and this is a cycle of life. SubhanAllah, you start young and you get in your prime and then you get old and end of story. Likewise, maybe you start medium, you get some money, you make, mashallah, the best of it, buy a new car, buy a house, a mortgage, and then financial crisis and you lose you lose all, subhanAllah. The wife divorces you, the kids ask you for uh, uh, money, etc. Life is difficult. But the Prophet is showing you the way, alayhi salatu wasalam, utilize these things. So, to utilize your time is something that is logical. You don't have to become a Muslim to know this. Even the non-Muslims know this, right? MashaAllah, I go to the... Uh, 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 I use the train and I go on in, in, in the tube and I see non-Muslims holding books and reading. MashaAllah, what are they doing? They're reading Harry Potter. Okay, <laughs> at least they're reading. They're doing something useful with the time for a couple of hours. Some brothers, Muslims, MashaAllah, holding the Qur'an, reciting the Qur'an, the whole Mus'haf in every three to five days because they commute a lot. Other brothers, MP3s, <laughs> what is this? It's just Afasi Sheikh. Afasi, I'm listening to the Quran, but he has a nice beat. <laughs> Subhanallah. Others with the blackberry, a couple of hours of their time. What are you doing? I'm just chatting, Sheikh. But inshallah for the tarot. <laughs> so are they utilizing their time? Even the non Muslims know the importance of time. So they utilize and they try. So we as Muslims, we should do this because our religion orders us to do this. Isn't, isn't that so? The Prophet says in the authentic hadith, Allahumma salli wa sallim ala. Whenever you hear the Prophet's name, offer salutation. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala Muhammad. He said that if the day of judgment is being called, it's now, it's today. And you have a small tree in your hand, you were about to plant it. If it's a day of judgment, what would you do? <laughs> Crazy, it's just a day of judgment. Everything's got, the Prophet says, Alaihi if you see the day of judgment is being called and you have this small tree in your hand, do not put it down until you plant it. What does this mean? This means that our religion is a positive religion. It's a religion that benefits others, not only us. It's so stated that one uh, Khalifa of the Abbasi era came and saw an old man in his 70s planting a tree of uh, uh, olive uh, tree. And this takes approximately 20 to 30 years to harvest. So the Khalifa, the Caliph, looked at him and said, Old man, do you hope to live 
this long so that you would be able to harvest this olive tree? And the old man looked at him and he said, O oh, Caliph, you're a wise and great man. I've enjoyed the olives that were planted long before I was born. And I plant this olive tree so that those who come after me would be able to eat from it. And this is the positive way of acting. It's not a selfish way. If it's me, okay. If it's not, the hell with everybody else. I could care less. No. A Muslim thinks for the welfare of the others, of the community. Of course, above all, his own welfare, his own reward at the sight of Allah. What good would it do me if you all go to paradise and I go to hell? With all due respect. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nothing personal, but I'd rather go to paradise and then think about you later on. So, uh, the Prophet ﷺ is encouraging us to plant this tree so that we could utilize our time and we would make the best of it. Also, the Prophet ﷺ says in the authentic hadith, on the Day of Judgment, do not even think that you will not be accountable for the things you did, you've done. The Prophet says alayhi salatu wasalam, a person will not be let go on the day of judgment, on the day of resurrection, until he has been asked about five things in another hadith, four things. But they all go in the same line. He says alayhi salatu wasalam, he will be asked about his life and how he spent it. So, be sure, the past 20, 20 plus years ago, Allah will ask you about each and every moment you have spent this life in. And how, then the Prophet said, and his knowledge, and what he did with it. What kind of knowledge? Physics, chemistry, math, management, accounting, no. The knowledge mentioned in this Quran, uh, in this hadith, as the knowledge mentioned in the Quran, is the knowledge of Allah. You know Allah, right? You know the Quran, right? You know the hadith. What did you do? I know a lot of the brothers where I come from, whenever I come to t say, tell them that this is haram, or the Prophet says, they say, I don't want to hear. Akhi, what? I don't want to hear. Why? He says, because on the Day of Judgment, Allah will tell me, what did you do with your knowledge? So if I listen to you, Allah is going to punish me. So mashaAllah, tabarakallah. That's, that's, I never thought of it this way. This is stupid, Lord of respect. Because Allah will punish you for not asking. If you live in a, a Muslim country or in a Muslim community, then you say, well, I didn't know that a, a, a pint of lager is haram. I always thought that it's okay, everybody's doing it. I didn't ask, but... I didn't want to ask so that I would not burden myself. Allah will punish you for that. So, not knowing is good if you have no means to learn. But if you deliberately refuse to learn, Allah will hold you accountable. His knowledge and what He did with it. His wealth, where from He got it and where did He spend it in. So it's not only where do you get your money. Okay, I get my money from halal means. Good. You have, you're clear. Where did you spend it at? At the lottery. I only buy two tickets a day. If I win, alhamdulillah, jackpot. If I lose, yeah, I mean, it's okay with me. I have no problem. This is lottery, this is gambling, this is a major sin. Allah associated it with intoxicants in Surah Al-Ma'idah. Which is nothing to be taken lightly. Where did you spend your money? I bought a LCD 52 inch. It's a little bit expensive, but it's, it's good shit. What do you watch on it? Peace TV. MashaAllah, and you have to see Dr. Zach Naik in big proportions so that Allah would reward you. Yeah, yeah I see a few things here and there, Sheikh, but uh, Allah would ask you about every penny you spent. If it's being spent wisely, MashaAllah, you're on the clear. If not, get ready. And the Prophet says, والسلام, and his body and how he used it. How did you use your body? Did you use it wisely? Did you use it in fasting and praying and going for Umrah and helping others 
in uh, 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 permissible activities, in working out, in staying healthy, or you abused it. You used to smoke, you used to drink, you used to fornicate, you used to um, <coughs> intimidate people. MashaAllah, I'm strong and bulky, I can, you know, hit someone with the shoulder, legal shoulder. And I do this and, and I, I scare people. Allah Azza would ask you about this on the Day of Judgment. So, we have lots of questions to answer. May Allah Azza wa make it easy upon us. Therefore, our time, our life is actually measured by days. And the countdown, countdown had started long time ago. Al-Hasan al-Basri, one of the great tabi'eens, used to say, Oh, you, Bani Adam, the son of Adam, you're merely a number of days. Every day that goes, portion of your life is gone. So our life is like the calendar paper. It's made of like 360 days. Every time you take one, this is one day of my life is gone. And I'm, I'm, I'm losing days. Ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him. One of the great companions of the Prophet and the one who used to carry the wudu and he used to carry the sandals of the Prophet This guy was amazing. He was a shepherd. And before long, he became the greatest or one of the greatest companions of the Prophet Due to the Quran that he decided, he said, I took 70 plus surahs directly from the mouth of the Prophet And he was also the Amir of Al-Kufa and he was the one who used to teach Hadith and give fiqh and one of the prominent scholars of the companions. Companions or scholars, he was one of the top uh, ones among them. He says, I despise seeing a man not involved in something that draws him closer to Allah or something that benefits him in this life. So what is he doing? Nothing. Wasting time. If you're not working on your thesis or your papers or studying for university, if you're not working for a good job, if you're not fixing your car or your house or doing the plumbing, if you're not doing something that benefits you in this life, and at the same time you're not doing, the time you're utilizing is not for getting closer to Allah, what are you doing? Ibn Masur says, I despise such a person. Eight hours watching a cricket match, this, or, or a football match. People here love football. Twenty men running after a ball full of air. Buy another 19 balls and give each one a ball. Come on. <laughs> Why fight over it? It's, it's ridiculous, but it's a strange country. May Allah Azza wa protect us all. Um, Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, and this is what all righteous, knowledgeable people put in front of them. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, أَفَحَسِبْتُمْ أَنَّمَا خَلَقَنَاكُمْ عَبَثًا وَأَنَّكُمْ إِلَيْنَا لَا تُرْجَعُونَ This is a question which is an eye-opener. It should be. Allah says in the Quran, and, and this is Allah's words, you know, is it authentic, Shaykh? This is Allah's word that was preserved for the past 15 years and it will be preserved until the day of judgment. Allah says in the Quran, what translates to, Did you think that we had created you in play without any purpose and that you would not be brought back to us? Allah created us just for the heck of it. Just to have fun, eat, to drink, and play, and go to unis, and graduate, and be unemployed for six years? <laughs> Do you think this is what Allah Azza wa created us for? No. Wallahi, I wish He did. It would have been fun. I would have enjoyed life. I wouldn't have been going from one place to the other giving da'wah, Allah says, the Prophet says, I would have had fun, and like, be like everyone else, but this is not the case. Allah is testing us. This life is a test. And not only in universities, if I go outside, someone bangs my car, not my brother's car, inshallah nothing happens to his car. But if someone bangs my car, this is a test. 
if someone does not buy my car, my car is safe, this is a test. Am I thankful? Am I grateful? Am I patient? Am I tolerant? Do I have sins? I have to expiate them by calamities that befall upon me, tribulations, etc. Life is a test. Marriage is a test. Having kids is a test. Obeying your parents is a test. Having a controlling mother who nags on your back 24-7, well, I, this is a test. But it is a test that you either fail or, 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 or pass. So everything in this life is a test. So do you think that Allah has created us without any purpose and that we're not going to go back to Him? Well, think again. How much time do you have? Okay. The, our predecessors, they used to utilize their time extremely well. Abu Hurairah, may Allah be pleased with him, he used to divide the night into three portions. One third to sleep, one third to offer night prayer, and one third to study the hadith of the Prophet to memorize it because he was, and he still is, on the top of the list in those who narrated hadith of the Prophet the Prophet prayed for, uh, for him that he would never forget the hadith and so he did not. A Shafi, may Allah have mercy on his soul, also used to do the same, to divide the night because they had to manage their time. Most of the scholars and the ulama used to utilize their time. Ibn al-Jawzi, Abu al-Faraj, the one uh, a scholar known to have, for example, the book of Sayyid al-Khatir, the book of Zad al-Masir, in tafsir, the book of al-hadith al al-mawdu'ah, in the hadith, etc. He has so many books, but he used to utilize his time. He mentioned in, hadith, in the book of Sayyid al-Khatir that I used to utilize the time, but there are things in life that you cannot do anything about. When your relatives come and visit you to connect the next of kin, you have to invite them when someone wants to uh, uh, pay a, a, a courtesy visit. You have to accept their invitation. So what would I do? They talk in nonsense. They talk about things of this life. I did this, I did that, I chit-chatted here and there. So he said, I thought of it and I understand from the Quran and Sunnah that I have to meet these people. I can't live in isolation. So I came up with this idea. When they come, I prepare the wood, because they did not have pens, they had the wood that they have to sharpen and the ink and they had these papers made, they have to fold and prepare into books, etc. So whenever they come to talk to me for half an hour, I used to sit and utilize my time. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> okay, establishing, uh, doing things, preparing things that do not require concentration, but at the same time, utilizing the time. Abu al-Hatim al-Razi, his son says that my father used to have me read to him books of knowledge when he's eating, when he's drinking, even when he goes to answer the call of nature. I would stay outside and read so that he would be all the time utilizing. They did not have any MP3s, no iPads, no iPods, nothing. So he had to do this for him. When you look at the life of, for example, an Nawawi. May Allah have mercy on his soul. He died when he was in his 40s. Not married, lucky him. <laughs> they calculated, they calculated the time of his life. And they calculated according to the number of books he had written that he used to write 20 pages a day. Not copying, he was thinking it over and coming with great books and that's why we have Al-Majmur in Sharh al muhadda We have Rawdat Al-Talibin in the Fiqh of Al-Shafi'i. We have the Book of al Athkar. We have the Sahih Muslim, the, uh, the, the commentary on Sahih Muslim, all written in this short lifespan. They say that Al-Imam Al-Tabari, the author of Tariq Al-Muluk, the author of Tafsir Al-Tabari, the author of so many things, had 
or used to write about 30 or uh, 40 pages a day. And he would not miss one minute of his day. To the extent that on his dying bed, people were visiting him. And one of those who were visiting him said, uh, May Allah make it easy on you, Imam. Uh, the Prophet وسلم, said so and so and so and so. He heard the dua. So in his dying bed, he told his assistant, go and get me the ink pot and the pen so that I can write this down. And those around him said, give us a break. He's dying. Why are you schmuck? Why are you? You're dying. You're 80 plus years old and you're dying. You want to write this thing down? He said, my friend, a true practicing Muslim must not stop from acquiring knowledge. Who knows? Maybe this hadith I'm going to write, Allah would save me from hell with it. Look at the utilization of time they had. They were not like us. We, on the other hand, what do we do? PlayStation, Nintendo, these are you know, the practicing Muslims. Huh? I'm not talking about movies, I'm not talking about discotheques, I'm not talking about nightclubs, I'm not talking about smoking a joint here or there, I'm not talking about you know, party time, it's Saturday night, it's Thursday, Friday, well, Saturday is Thursday, it's Friday. Friday night, I'm talking about your day-to-day -day time. What do you do? If you ask any Muslim, what are you doing? He, say, he says, or he tells you, I'm killing time. What's a crime? <laughs> what did time do so that you would kill it? So now, um, it's a figure of speech, Sheikh. No. You are actually killing your time, and this time is the time that Allah would hold you accountable on the Day of Judgment. No one would be let go on the Day of Judgment until he's asked about his time. And that is why you should try to manage your time. Okay, Shaykh, khalas, I'm going to quit university, I'm going to go to the masjid and spend the rest of my time and life in the masjid. Zakallah khair, it's very touching. No, I, I, did not, I don't want you to do this. It would be insane, because if you do this, you would not be a practicing Muslim. Subhanallah. So I'm not going to pray in the masjid, I'm going to focus on my studies, and um, until I graduate, afterwards I start to pray. Again, you will not be, become, you will not be a Muslim. Any Muslim who does not pray, he is not a Muslim. <coughs> He's a kafir. Sheikh, I fast. I offer hajj. I make umrah. I give zakat. I'm kind to my parents. I'm truthful. But I don't pray. You're a kafir. <laughs> Do I get there, there was a debate between Dr. Sheikh Abu Amin Abdel Phillips and myself a couple of years ago in Green Lane Masjid in Birmingham. That is called the great great debate on the ruling on those who abandon prayer. It's nice, you can I think download it from YouTube or you can buy it here. But the most authentic opinion of scholars is that whoever abandons prayer, who does not pray at all, he's a Catholic. Even if his name is Muhammad and his father's name is Abdullah, he's still a kafir. Because the Prophet says والسلام, in the hadith is Sahih Muslim that the thing that separates a man from kufr and shirk is prayer. So if he abandons prayer, he's a kafir. And this is added in Sunan Abi Dawood. So it's, a, it's a, not an easy thing to uh, 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 do. So what do you want us to do? You want us to pray in the masjid all, full time, or you want us to study, or you want us to work out in the gym, you want us to work in offices and gain money and become rich, and then we repent to Allah Azza wa Jal. We want you to become balanced. You have to go and learn how to manage your time. Time management is essential. But if you don't know the value of time, what am I going to manage? So what we spoke about was the value of time. So how can I manage my time? Well, this is something you have to do on your own. You have to prioritize things. Always things that come on top are the things that please Allah. Prayers, you never play around with prayers. You have to pray on time. This is a priority regarding prayers. Everything else must fit in its proper slot in the day. Now, you know Salman al Farisi? You know him. You know Abu Darda? Come on, don't lie. Who's Abu Darda? First time I hear this guy's name. 
is one of the companions, uh, uh, one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. He, may Allah have uh, uh, be pleased with him, was known to be the Hakim of the companions, the wise man, because he has so many uh, statements that he used to say that were so beautiful that you could always get yeah, remember them. This man, at the very beginning of time, when the Prophet has some migrated from Mecca to Medina, when the migrants with Muhajireen arrived in Medina, they were stone broke. They had nothing. So what did the Prophet do, Alaihissalam? He made them brothers. In the beginning, he used to take one from Al Muhajireen and he would say to the one from Al Ansar, he's your brother. If one of you dies, the other one inherits him. As if he was his flesh brother, you know. So the Prophet ﷺ made Abd Rahman ibn Auf and Sa'd ibn Rabi' brothers. When you know this the story, of course. <laughs> Everybody's saying yes. Do you know the story of Sa'd ibn Rabi' and, and Abd Rahman ibn Auf? No. No. Abd Rahman ibn Auf was a merchant from Quraysh, but when he came to Medina, he did not have anything. Sa'd ibn Rabi' when the Prophet told him that this is your brother, he came to him. He said, Abd Rahman, everyone in Medina knows that I'm the richest in Medina. So here's half of what I own. This is my wealth. 50% is yours. He is the richest. He could have said, listen, this is a thousand quid. I tried to do something with it. He gave him half of his wealth. Not only that, he had two wives. He said, I have two of the most gorgeous wives in Arabia of excellent lineage. And I'm a very jealous person. But because you're my brother, because you're a Muslim, and because the Prophet told us to take care of you, you look which one you like, and I will divorce her. And after she becomes halal, you can marry her. If I was in his shoes, oh, oh. yeah, <laughs> now you're talking money and a free mistress. Whoa, Abd Rahman bin Auf is one of the ten heaven bound companions, the top ten companions of the Prophet in heaven. What did he say? May Allah bless your wealth and may Allah bless your family. Tell me where the souk is. And in a couple of weeks' time, he got married, he, got, he made money, he sold and bought on credit, not this credit, credit yani without any riba. And subhanAllah, after a few months time, he became the richest man in Arabia. This is balance. Did he skip a, a prayer, Fajr prayer? Why didn't you pray Fajr? Uh, Rasul, oh Prophet of Allah, you know, I had a meeting last night, it was a dinner meeting, and we had to go to Hackney, we had to go to this place and that place, I skipped Fajr. No, he never skipped one Fajr. He never skipped one battle with the Prophet He never skipped one lecture or any place that the Prophet did or went to. Yet he became the richest man in Arabia. So this is the balance we're talking about. This is not our subject, Manish. Our subject is that Abu Darda and Salman, the Prophet made them brothers. So Salman went to visit his brother in his house. He saw Mrs. Abu Darda. Her name was Umm Darda. He was married to two. Umm Darda Kubra, she died. He married another one and nicknamed her Umm Darda Sura. So he looked at her and he, he saw that she was not taking good care of herself and that was before hijab. That at, at the very early times of Medina. So he said, what's wrong? Why aren't you taking good care of yourself? She said, well, your brother Abu Darda, mashallah, he spends all night praying and all day fasting. Alhamdulillah, meaning he's not going to have enough time to look even at his wife. So Salman said, okay. And he waited until Abu Darda came. And he served his guest, Salman, food. Okay, brother, this is food. So Salman told him, you eat first. You're the owner of the house. He said, no, no I'm fasting. He said, eat. He said, no, no, I'm fasting. He said, wallahi, you will eat. I will not eat until you eat. So Abu Darda mm, weighed it and then said, okay, I'm going to break. It's voluntary fasting, so what the heck. He broke his fast and he ate. They prayed Isha. After Isha, Abu Darda performed evolution and Bismillah, Allah, what, what are you doing? So I'm praying night prayer. Night prayer is 8 o'clock. 
go to sleep. So no, no, I want to pray. Salman said, go to sleep. So he slept for an hour and then nine o'clock, stood up to pray. Salman was still awake. He said, go to sleep. Nine, ten, eleven, three, three thirty. It's an hour almost to Fajr. Salman said, now you come, you go and pray. So they all woke up, washed, prayed uh, night prayer. And after they finished, Salman addressed Abu Darda, teaching him. And the Prophet said about Salman, Salman minna al al -bayt. Salman is one of us. And his story is a different ball game altogether. He's known in, in the books of history as the seeker of truth. How his father was the guardian of the fire that the fire worshippers worship in Persia, in Iran. And how he fled and believed and then he went to Iraq uh, to a priest, to another priest. And how he, was, uh, he went to Sham and then how he was sold as a slave only seeking the truth. This is a, a, a different story. So after they prayed night prayer, just before Fajr, Salman said to Abu Darda, Abu Darda, Allah has rights over you, and your wife has rights over you, and your body has rights over you, and your guests have rights over you. So give each its due right. Abu Darda did not swallow this quite well, so prayed Fajr with the Prophet went to the Prophet, and he said, Listen to what Abu Dhabi, uh, Salman said. He said, so and so and so and so. What did the Prophet say, as Salam? Sadaqa Salman. Salman has said the truth. Meaning that our religion is based on balance. You have to balance. You cannot be a good da'i and you don't know what your kids are doing. Or you, you, your wives don't. Uh, uh, get the time to spend with you, quality time. Every time they talk to you, no, 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 I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm answering emails, I'm doing lectures, I'm traveling. And you cannot be a good Muslim if you're 24 hours sitting with the missus and the kids playing around and having quality time, never attending prayer in the masjid. And you cannot be a strong Muslim if you don't work out, you know, with, with your belly like... Uh, Mashallah, six, seven foot ahead of you. <laughs> and someone's asked you, what's the size of your shoes? I don't know, I haven't seen my legs in a long time. You have to have the balance. The balance in acquiring proper knowledge of the Quran and Sunnah. And the balance of being a good citizen. Benefiting the Muslims. Studying engineering, medicine, accounting, Islamic accounting. Uh, uh, economics, etc. And you have to be a good parent, a good husband, a caring, good, loving husband, and a good driver. No offense. <laughs> a good driver when you're driving on the street. You have to, to be a good neighbor. So many of us don't know our neighbors. Why? Yeah, Sheikh did Kafir. So what? <laughs> the Prophet had Kafir neighbors. I saw him. He used to take care of them. He used to visit them. So we have to have the balance, not to go to extreme on the account of other things. And I apologize for becoming late and for this also uh, lecture on time management, but I hope we will manage our time, inshallah, later on in a better way. Wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala abdihi wa rasulihi nabiyyina Muhammad.